All right. Um, the Shewe Jahnu Project, Designing a Pigeon for Language Revitalization. Um, my name is Neil Alexander Walker. I go by Alex. So this is a presentation about Southern Pomo, an indigenous language of Northern California. Um, it's a language with no living fluent speakers, and it is somewhat unusually the heritage language of multiple federally recognized tribes in the Sonoma County um, uh, area. <clears throat> so in this map, um, the light blue areas are all Pomoan languages. So there are seven Pomoan languages and you can see Santa Rosa there at the very bottom of the light blue area. Um, Wapo is an unrelated language, which is in dark blue and the gray areas are also unrelated languages. So Southern Pomo, as you can see, was spoken around Santa Rosa and then also further to the north with a little branch out to the coast. So in the past, there have been some serious efforts at language revitalization. So the Dry Creek Ranch Rio Band of Pomo Indians ran a language revitalization program for Southern Pomo from 2011 to 2014. Um, and uh, I actually, ran that for them. I was the language project coordinator. Um, Southern Pomo was actually only one of two heritage languages for um, this rancheria, the other being Wapo, which is unrelated. Uh, Dry Creek students and students from four additional federally recognized tribes attended weekly language classes. So we were privileged to have students from Grayton and Hopland and Cloverdale and Kashaya. We'd have visitors from elsewhere as well. And this uh, program included <clears throat> instructional media, um, such as smartphone apps, interactive signage, games, dedicated website, and so on. So some of the major efforts that were part of this revitalization program included teaching correct pronunciation, which was really important to allow students to distinguish um, the many morphemes that uh, are used in, in words. Basic greetings, but and most importantly, access traditional narratives through reading and listening. And we had a lot of success in this program. Uh, most students learned the Southern Pomo alphabet without any great difficulty. Um, prior to this program, honestly, most, most people in the tribe under age 50 knew zero words. Um, and even those under 70 rarely knew more than two or three. So we had students coming in knowing almost nothing of the language and they'd leave sometimes knowing, you know, 500 words. So there was, there was an increase in overall knowledge, um, especially related to culturally significant items. And importantly, students were made aware of these extant um, uh, narratives, which weren't published, uh, none published at the time in the original language and you'd had to go to the archives in Berkeley to get a hold of them. So there were some successes. So here's an alphabet poster we created as part of the program. This is still hanging on the walls of um, many tribal members' houses. Um, and it just shows the Southern Pomo alphabet. And there were also some failures. So first of all, students were not taught a conversational register. And this is because I don't know it. We don't have a living speech community um, the last speaker at the, was still alive at the time, but had dementia. And so we really didn't have access to conversational data. Um, many tribal members really wanted to be able to use the language <clears throat> to introduce themselves at intertribal events, and they were unable to do so. And one of the insurmountable problems, it would seem, uh, the complexities of Southern Pomo relative to English discourage many students from learning. So after the end of classes, um, I started informal talks with some of my former students, including two members of the board of directors for the Dry Creek Ranch Rio Band of Pomo Indians. And we, we just knocked around some ideas of what we could do. 
you know, how can we keep the language interest going? How can we be true to the language? And how can we help people who just either don't have the time or enough desire at this stage in their lives to, to, to dig in? And so as I was reading um, about some, you know, unrelated things, I came across um, Chinook jargon, <clears throat> which I knew about but hadn't been thinking about. And so it gave me some inspiration. So this is Chinook jargon is an indigenous pigeon from North America, Pacific Northwest. Uh, and jargon here just being an older name, an old fashioned name for what we would now call pigeon. And um, the definition of pigeon that I'll be using throughout this presentation is as follows, taken from home, 1988. A pigeon is a reduced language that results from extended contact between groups of people with no language in common. Okay, so what does this mean for us? Well, unlike many other pigeons, <clears throat> which were often lexified by English or Portuguese, Chinook jargon is primarily um, lexified by indigenous languages from the Pacific Northwest. But unlike those indigenous languages from which it takes most of its words, it has simplified morphosyntax. So how did it work? Well, again, most of the words in Chinook jargon came from local indigenous languages there. Um, but though the jargon is simplified in terms of its morphosyntax, it did not simplify the sounds. So this is something that really struck me. You have a, a pigeon and we have this idea of pigeons as being somehow simpler, but this pigeon kept all the sounds uh, of the indigenous languages, including many that are very hard for English speakers. Uh, Europeans also spoke this, this pigeon. So this is something really wonderful. At one point in time, 100,000 people were using this pigeon uh, in Oregon territory in British Columbia and toward the end of the 19th century. And oftentimes English speakers would substitute English sounds for these sounds, but the sounds would still remain in the speech of indigenous peoples using the pigeon and many um, American and, and, and British people who moved to the area. Now the, the syntax was simple and rigid, the vocabulary was limited, but culture important words often remained. You can see down here like in Yitrich and so on. Okay. So here's a sample of Chinook jargon to show you kind of what we're talking about here. And I'm no expert pronouncing it, so I'll get, do my best. Nsaika papa hlaksta mitlai kupa sahali hlush maika nem. So you can see right away, other than papa and nem, there's really nothing from English. These are totally unrelated words, but there's really nothing going on morphologically. You have a one to one correspondence. Our is nsaika. Father is Papa, who is Hlaksta, lives, Mitlite, uh, so on. So what does this have to do with Southern Pomo and the language revitalization efforts? Well, there's still a great desire by tribal members to use the language. <clears throat> and the language as spoken by the, the last speakers uh, is rich, complex, and there's no one alive to model it. And when I would talk with uh, people uh, at Dry Creek and other tribes, it seems like two of the biggest reasons, two of the biggest um, desires is to express identity and to be able to have a language you can use in public to obfuscate conversation. So you're in the line at Target and you wanna say, hey, look at that guy, he smells terrible. Okay, <clears throat> so, the idea was to create a pigeon, a Southern Pomo pigeon, but in this case, unlike, shall we call them natural pigeons, where it would arise as a trade language uh, spoken by people who don't share a language in common, this is gonna be a pedagogical tool. So this pigeon is gonna have to be a little bit different, but can't be too different to, to have that easy learnability that we know pigeons have. So the idea is to create a pigeon that is maximally learnable for English speakers without reducing things that will be necessary for students who want to go on to a fuller understanding of the language. So uh, I began talking with Joe Gonzalez. Um, he is a former traditional dancer, 
uh, talented artist and um, current member of the board of directors for the Directory Rancheria. He's also my wife's first cousin and we've been good friends for a long time. And he's, he was one of my best students and um, just an excellent person. So we started talking and, and, and talking about the Chinook jargon um, example. And so one of the things he was adamant about is we cannot lose any of the sound contrasts in Southern Pomo. So that's a, that's a no-go. Just like with Chinook jargon, we're gonna keep all the sounds. But of course, English speakers and all tribal members this time are English speakers, um, are free to substitute English sounds, but the model will keep all the sounds and the, the target ultimately will be to try and keep these distinctions. And of course, vocabulary, though reduced, is gonna be carefully chosen to preserve examples of all these sounds. So here is the Southern Pomo alphabet. It's an Americanist uh, system. The, this has been used by the tribe since 2011. Um, there are several people who have type in this with their keyboards, um, no problems there. You can see that Southern Pomo has a healthy number of obstruents, but nothing too terrible. And there's the vowel. So again, this is how we actually transcribe the language. Okay, so looking at the vocabulary in this pigeon, <clears throat> we've decided that words should be learned with only one or two forms. So none of the endless possible conjugations of verbs as you feel there are when you learn the language as it was spoken. Um, but we ought to make sure that these words, these simplified words are valid words in Southern Pomo. So, shewe jahnu, you remember from the title, just means new language, new talk. And um, so we want the new to not be from outside the old, okay? So words need to be learnable, but they should be real words in, I don't wanna call it old Southern Pomo, but you know, full traditional Southern Pomo. And they need to be selected on the basis of users' needs and cultural value. So this is actually just a little snippet of a table that Joe Gonzalez, the aforementioned um, director at Dry Creek Rancheria, um, made in 2019 after we um, began discussing this project. So this is all typed by him. Um, you can see uh, his use of that orthography and entirely from his memory from our classes. Uh, and he was just trying to spitball, what are the words that he thinks we need? So I think he picked about 500 core words and we're trying to build from there and some set phrases. So the goal is to have about a thousand words or fewer, um, you know, maybe 500 target words, with another 500 that are culturally relevant, but maybe aren't high frequency. And we're looking at function words, nouns, but we also wanna really focus on words that um, are in the extant narratives. So the goal again being people can learn this pigeon quickly, they can start using it, feel cultural pride, talk with each other, but have it be a, a bridge to the full language. And since there aren't that many narrative texts, but what does exist is of high quality, um, gives even folks a chance to, to interact with that level of the culture. So the, following with pigeons in general, the goal is to have the syntax be, um, sorry, here. Simple, <clears throat> but but to still be Pomoan. So the default word order, if you actually were to have, you know, full noun phrases within a clause, would be S O V, um, as in the example here, Budaka do juhu, bear eats the acorns, and so the idea is yes, is we're going to keep the syntax simple and we're going to use word order. Um, for grammatical relations, but it's going to be a Pomoan word order so that students are already going to be exposed to a little different way of doing things. Okay, but we have complications. It's not as simple as just picking the easy form. You know, um, verbs and kinship terms are morphologically complex and they don't have roots that can stand alone. And many basic concepts, which English speakers are used to handling through, you know, prepositions, um, are encoded by affixes in Southern Pomo. So in order to do anything, really, we're gonna to have to make some pretty major alterations, which if we're just making a pigeon, to make a pigeon, we can throw whatever we want out, but we're making a pigeon that's a bridge to the full language. And so this requires some nuance. So here's some solutions. So for example, the kinship terms, which are beautifully complex in terms of their morphology, um, the child vocative or informal vocative forms, which 
reduplicate the root and often have like a an irregular form of the root that's easier for children to pronounce. Um, these are the forms that were like the last to be forgotten by speakers. So they're the ones, if anyone knows a kinship term, they'll know it in this child vocative. So child speaking to the parent informal vocative. So for example, may, may, daddy would re, would just be used for, for father. Whereas, you know, in the class I'm having to teach people to, you know, decline father. Amen, ameto, me, e, mi, ame, mi, ame, me, e, ma, e, ma, and me, de, me, me, and so on. Similarly, te, te for, for mother, for mommy, rather than having to decline ach and ach eto, me, te, me, te, mi, te, mi, te, ma, te, ma, and so on. Okay, and you can see there's even suppletion in some of these uh, kinship paradigms. All right, but all kinship roots will be kept, and, and the Southern Pomo kinship terms are very rich, not just in terms of their morphology, but also in terms of their semantics. So, for example, we're going to keep father's father distinct from mother's father, and older sibling, you know, older sister, and older brother distinct from younger sibling, and so on. In some cases, not all forms are attested, and I might have to reconstruct something. Um, so, for example, I'm not entirely sure of the child vocative form of tiki, but I think it is just tiki for younger sibling. Okay, verbs offer similar complications. Roots are somewhat opaque and they never occur on their own. And of course, pigeons are supposed to be morphologically simple. So what do we do? Um, and uh, of course, many of these categories where English uses separate words, they're encoded, but through bound morphemes. So for example, English says, I will go, but so the poem has holy kewa'a. So what do we do here? Uh, concepts that are handled with prepositional phrases are handled through a bunch of complex affixes. Okay. So the idea is to go ahead and um, just pick the perfective form, which is the citation form of verbs, and just teach that form as the verb. So the students will at first not learn that you've got a perfective affix. There are some irregularities in the perfective affix. I mean, it, it is regular, but a student would have to learn that you've got some allomorphy. So W after vowels, uh, U after D, zero after consonants other than D. They're not gonna learn that. They'll just learn the words as chunks. Um, but we don't wanna get rid of all morphology. We're gonna add a little bit. The future is completely regular more or less. And so the idea is to keep the future um, form of verbs and um, to use just a handful of morphemes for direction. So kind of reduce um, what we have. So like in Tokpisin, the pigeon spoken in Melanesia, you know, you have two prepositions, only one that really does locative work. And so you don't need that many to get by. All right. Um, there are, Southern Pomo doesn't have conjunctions as a word class. Instead, it has a complex system of switch reference suffixes. They're beautiful, they're wonderful. They're probably gonna to be too much to save much of. So the idea is to take the proverb hominy and use it sort of as and. Right now I'm playing with the idea of keeping two of the switch reference suffixes. It might be too, too complex, but it's not that much. So we're playing with it. The cause is gonna remain to be fossilized. So to hook out to feed versus juhu to eat. You know, so it'll be in words where it's needed, but I, they won't be taught overtly. All right, so here is a sample Shewe Jahnu paradigm. I'm putting in parentheses the, the singular imperative forms. We're not sure whether we're gonna do that or not. Students never seem to have too much trouble learning the singular imperative form. So I feel like we don't wanna throw it out just by being overly zealous about pigeonizing the language, but we'll see. And you can see here, you know, just Holio would be the base form. Holik K is the future. Holin go, and who knows? So, Wadu Huanke, Huadun, Juhu, Juhu, Ke, Juhu, and so on. Um, we have other issues. How should the copy of the clauses be formed? Should there be a fixed order for adjectives within noun phrases? How many verbs are necessary? How many nouns? How many numbers? Possible answers. I'm thinking um, juxtaposition can be used for copy of the clauses. There, there, there is an enclitic that's historically a copy of plus a factual evidential. They sort of fuse and they the two work together now as like a, as like a copula, more or less. Um, it's not that hard to use, but ultimately, it probably wouldn't be necessary to add that. Um, just saying he good, he a man, it's going to work fine. Um, I think 
where adjectives go doesn't matter. You see it in the data for the original language coming before and after, and I don't have enough data to really know whether there's free variation or it's word specific. Okay. Um, in terms of nouns, we wanna go with basic things, but also really focus on culturally salient ones. We do have numbers above 10. We've got numbers through 20 and um, 20, 25, 30, number 40. Uh, I, I feel personally that just one through 10 is fine. Since we don't have a complete set of numbers, let's just do one through 10. Some of the numbers above 10 get a little bit squirrely and we don't have audio records of them and they're, they, they're quite phonologically complex. Um, and we can maybe just use multiplication to form the higher numbers. There is some precedence for this. For example, Akko is two, Mihja is four, the number eight is Komja, which is literally two fours. It's been truncated and made into a compound. So multiplication was a part of the language. So I think it's culturally acceptable. But again, we're still discussing this. All right, so here's a sample text of Shewe Jahnu. Atto Ashiyan Alex, a a Australia Tonjiyo, a a Juhuya ko di Juhu Hudakai, a a Shewe Jahnu Hiduch Edu, a a Shewe Jahnu Jan Hodemke, a Maya al Kejahnu Omike. Um, and this this would be uh, absolutely intelligible to a native speaker if we could go into a time machine. It's going to sound weird, but by keeping the the sounds, it would sound no weirder than saying, um, "Me, Alex. Me in Australia live. Me, good food eat. To like to you know like it's ultimately it's not exactly how the language was, but it's not so far apart. And um, and if you look closely, you wonder why it says me name Alex. It's because name is an inalienably possessed item. And so you use the patient case form of the first person singular pronoun. So we're gonna, you know, we're keeping some little grammatical tidbits that have to do with the culture. You can't give away your name, you can't sell your name, it can't be taken from you. So it's it's a part of you. All right, thank you very much.